Franny, welcome back to Fort Wayne. Thank you. It's, it's, good, good, to have you. it's good. good to have you here. Yeah, we think of you as part of the family, you know. Like, um, uh, you know, my PhD works in Islam, and uh, um, you, you can't be a student of uh, uh, Islamic studies or Islam without uh, knowing the name of Ali Hassan, Abu Hassan uh, Ali of Nafi, known as Ziryad. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of him. I think of him uh, and his impact on culture in European society really the same way I think of Rumi and his influence on the mystical life or uh, uh, Ibn Sina and his influence on medicine and uh, uh, Al-Ghazali on philosophy and Suleiman the Magnificent on law and politics. And what I always found interesting, you referred to it in the play, how he bridges, I mean, his great influence, he bridges uh, the great Bayt al Hikmah, uh, the Abbasid, uh, uh, from the Abbasid dynasty in Baghdad, to the great uh, civilization, this tolerant, open, diverse Islamic civilization based in Cordoba. Mm -hmm. These two apexes, really, of uh, the Islamic history. Uh, so he's a giant, and, and as you and I talked before, he is probably the lesser known of the, of the uh, Islamic giants who I mentioned earlier. Tell us what drew you to Zirya. Boy, uh, I think it's when I was younger, um, being around uh, my dad and his friends who were all musicians, uh, I would get little anecdotes, little stories about different people, about different styles of music, uh, and mind you, this was all before the internet, so the only way you really transmitted or received knowledge was either through books or through meeting with people. And uh, one of my dad's friends uh, just started talking about Zariyad. He said something about me picking up the guitar and you should play the oud, and he said something about Zariyad. I said, who? He said, you don't know Zariyad. <laughs> Uh, I thought to myself, boy, you got to start telling me about this. And I discovered later that many people did not actually know about this ninth century polymath, you know. And he started to tell me, and that was when I was probably about 15, you know, something like that. And uh, it just stuck in the back of my mind for a while. And it wasn't until I got to college that, uh, you know, starting to study music and, and other things, among other things. And... The one thing that was just beaten to my head was that, you know, music began with Bach. And I just thought to myself, uh, music is, was being made before Bach. When? And that's when I rediscovered, so to speak, Andalusia. And Andalusia uh, represented really a special place in, in the culture and the heart of Arabs and Spaniards and Europeans alike, particularly the culture. But it wasn't until later that I started to understand Ziryab's role in Andalusia, Andalusian culture, and the golden age, and a golden era in Andalusia, that I started to dig even deeper. Uh, and it had been, like I said, something on my mind for a long time. I was doing a stint at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in 2012, 2011, I think. And they asked me to do a, a show they called The Green Shows, which were just these kind of like little concert-like shows before the actual performances would begin in the theaters. And I said, sure, I'd love to do something. And I thought, you know, I'm only the only person here, what, what do I do? And I took the opportunity to say, hey, you know, I've been wanting to tell the story of this guy named Zidiev. Let me uh, write something and I'll present that. And it was just kind of like the storytelling type of thing with the instrument. I just wanted people to even know who this person was. And Fortunately, I had a lot of time. I was right next to South Oregon University, so I had access to a university to do some research and, and you know, late night. And boy, I just went down the rabbit hole with the Zidiab and, and Andalusia because you can't remove him. He's part and parcel to that particular culture. And that, that was my first steps in really putting pen to paper and starting to write about him. You know, I'm glad you brought that up, the research, because... Uh, um uh, most of the information we have about Zuyab comes from the 7th, 17th century Algerian historian uh, uh, of Al-Andalus, Al-Bakari, mm -hmm. 
but he admits that most of his material on, on Zirya was taken from the 11th century Andalusian uh, uh, historian from Cordoba, uh, Ibn Hayyan, mm -hmm. who quotes even earlier works. So I'm just really interested in, you said down the rabbit hole, I'm interested in your rabbit hole, I'm interested in your research. In uh, al maqari was uh, foundational to much of my research because I was reading all of these books written by Western scholars, by Spaniards, and, and gathering, you know, little bits and pieces. Uh, I think one of my first articles that I read was out of Saudi Ar Aramco, and they had a, a lovely spread about Zidiev, and it was just uh, a lot of the anecdotes, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, where did you get these? And I was always one of those people that goes straight to the bibliography, you know? Yeah. I'm like, well, where did you get all this information <laughs> from? And eventually, you know, it led to reading several books, finding several different types of um, uh, material online, uh, things, uh, videos, movies, and um, I thought, well, what about the Arabic resources? Let me see what I can find in Arabic, which was a great benefit that I was able to research in Arabic, and I was able to find things in Arabic, particularly the Iraqi National Library uh, Archive. So what you mentioned. Yeah, yeah I, I was fascinated because I, I started to see, and that really inspired me because I saw uh, a poem that was written by Zidia dedicated to Harun al-Rashid. I thought, these are this guy's actual words. Uh, where can I find more? And it wasn't perhaps except for one or two books on Andalusia and Spain that I actually found the word al-Makkari. Somebody actually credited him, you know? And I thought, well, I have to find this book. And it's not a book, it's an entire volume series. Right. And uh, thank goodness for the internet, I found a PDF of this no 13,000 pages of so, uh, and downloaded all of it and just started to devour it. And I went, uh, and some of the find features were available to me, so I can type in Arabic, Zidiab, and it would take me to specific passages. And I was able to find many, many passages, including things that were not included at all in some of the Western sources in English. And in reading some of the passages in Arabic, I'm like, I've read this before. And I realized that many of these scholars were almost verbatim quoting things out of this book, like citing it. I mean, a 17th century historian is not going to come out of the grave and say, I was, I'm a lay faux pas, <laughs> you know? But uh, that book then led me to really dig deeper. And so I... Uh, got to speak to a friend of mine, um, Mohammed Balen, who has a wonderful uh, uh, blog called Balen Belus. And uh, he's actually Palestinian from Haifa, and he graduated with a PhD out of the uh, University of Chicago in almost exclusively, not only Andalusia, but the works of Lisan al-Din al Khatib and Ibn Hayyan. And he even wrote his dissertation on them. And so he, uh, he proved to me uh, to be a uh, and an incredible resource. So it just lead me down a lot of different other rabbit holes, so to speak. Uh, something that was also very helpful was, you know, I thought, no, I need to be in this place. I, remove, I need to remove myself from America and place myself in Spain, Andalusia. So I went to Cordoba several times, and just, just to get a feel and a vibe for what was it like here. So, yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, credit yourself this way, because I know you're very humble, but uh, um, you probably uh, are one of the few, I would call, experts on Ziryab uh, in America. I mean, you have done more research than 99.9% .9 of people in this country. I mean, do you find people quoting you or coming, coming to you? I, I have, you know, it's so funny. I did uh, an entire lecture unit for Georgetown University in August for their Summer Teachers Institute on Zidiev. Uh And it was just wonderful to rehash all of that because you can't talk about Zidiev and not talk about Andalusia or Islamic Iberia or, or you know. Or even the Beit al-Hikmah, where he come, from where he comes, you know, exactly. Harun Rashid. It, it, it's a point in history that I've always felt almost robbed of growing up in the public school system of America, that why well, didn't I learn about this? Because this isn't just my history, it's, it's history. And it's history that gave birth to the Enlightenment. It gave birth to the new world that we're in today. 
Without this particular period of history, this long stretch, we wouldn't have the advancements we have in medicine, in math, in science, in art, in philosophy, and all of these sorts of things. So I, I feel it's almost a disservice to history not to bring these kinds of things up. I was thinking of writing a blog posting, I was trying to come up with a clever title, you know, because in the West it's called the Dark Ages. Yeah. And so, of course, that's a misnomer because it's, it's not dark, it, it, it's, you know, it's dark in maybe Europe, you know. But on the other hand, Ziryab's nickname is Blackbird, you know, so the darkness is really light. I mean, you know, he, uh, the, 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 the man with the dark complexion really is the one who brings the light. Right, you know? yeah. And so, I mean, dark ages, no, but yes, I mean, uh, because of Ziryab, you know. You know, I look at that kind of dark age is always also kind of like, um, you know, in Islam, they call the pre-Islamic era uh, Jahiliya, you know, yeah, the age of ignorance, ignorance right? Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't ignorant. In fact, the, the poetry that came, the Arabic poetry that came out of there was so revered that it still hung up, the Mu'allafat that still hung up in the Kaaba in Mecca. That's right. So it, it's like, it, it wasn't ignorant at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you start off your play with the fifth string mm. is the soul, or for the soul. Mm. Um, uh, Knowing you the way I do, you're a soulful person. Uh, it, it's not surprising that you would be drawn to these two great Islamic civilizations where art, literature, poetry, intellectual endeavor, and most, of, mo most important, the great diversity of cultures, minds, hearts, peoples is preeminent. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about um, the fifth string uh, and the other strings. Uh, you're an Udist, an accomplished Udist, so talk about the fifth string, the Ud, how it connects to your own spiritual life. Sure. Um, well, it, it would make sense to show yeah. it as well. Uh, it's called Al Ud because Al Ud literally means like a twig or branch and it's made of wood. Prior to that, many instruments were made with uh, the skin of an animal. And initially, an instrument similar to this, which is featured in busts from Egypt to Mesopotamia, um, it was a little smaller, uh, it had maybe two strings on it, two or three, and then slowly but surely people would expound on that. By the 9th century, it had almost a similar shape to what you see here, minus this string. <laughs> that is the the middle one. The middle one that Zidia put in here, and eventually, the tuning, you know, for me at least, came to be in, in fourths, which means in music it's every fourth note, the next string would begin. And uh, that became kind of like a basis for a lot of stringed instruments, main, mainly for position, so one can place their fingers in the right way and then move to the next note. And so the guitar kind of takes the same type of um, uh, approach with tuning. Now, the unique thing about music in general, though, is the split between the, the spiritual and the scientific. Music was not only viewed as an art in the Middle East, and even in Zidiab's time. Uh, music was also viewed as a science. And in fact, they included it in astronomy. They the music of the spheres. The music of the spheres. They yeah. included it in, uh, in, in astronomy and math, uh, arithmetics. Uh, and they expounded on even Pythagorean theories of uh, that he proposed towards music as well. So really it's, it's, uh, it's a continuation, just like all knowledge really. It's, it's cumulative, it's, it's iterative, you know, it, it builds off of what's previously there. And when you get to Baghdad, especially during Zidiyev's time, uh, some of the first uh, treatises that we received about music about particularly one that we call Maqam music theory that is still in practice to this day uh, was put forth by not only uh, Zidiyev's teacher Ishaq al-Mawsuri but also his, his father uh, Ibrahim al-Mawsuri and then thereafter you have Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi and a lot of these people who wrote about the scientific aspects of music now this cannot be lost on what eventually would become the grandeur of, of Western music but these are the roots of, of music theory and how it relates to science. Philosophically and, and spiritually speaking, though, um, there were others who wrote about 
the philosophical implications, the Ikhwan Safa uh, wrote entire uh, treatises about music and what it means to the, uh, the body, what it means on the mind, what it means for the soul. Zidiak kind of falls in between a lot of this. He understands, obviously, the, the, um, the theoretical aspect of music, but from a spiritual perspective, uh, and I, I have to say, you know, many, many sources will, will uh, credit Zidiak to being of African descent, a free slave, uh, mainly because of his complexion. But if you speak to a Persian, they're going to say, no, he was Persian. <laughs> you speak to some Arab, he said, you know, he was Arab. He was this. The truth is, we won't really know. Part of the reason, though, we won't really know is also because Persia, Iraq, and that region in general was quite cosmopolitan. I mean, you had Africans, you had Central Asians, you had Mongolians, you had Arabs, you had Turks, you had a lot of different people lived in these regions. They were more confederacies than they were of ethnic tribes. And um, so, part of the reason, though, it alludes to saying that he was closer, probably, to being African, is uh, a lot of writing talks about his relationship with the spiritual world, with the jinn. Some people would say he did talk to the jinn. Uh, there was one account in, in Makkari's uh, writings of him that he woke up in a, a, a fit some, one time in Cordoba, summoned several of his musicians so that he can repeat something that was in his mind, that, uh, that was inspired by the jinn. And, you know, to me, hearing that, it's not far off from an anthropological perspective to realize, like, this guy was talking about basically what we see in Greek philosophy as the muses, you know? He had a muse. He had a, 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 something that was in him, external and internal, that inspired to shed, you know, to create this light, you know, that was inward. Uh, and I think music, in general, does unlock these things. And I think people had an understanding of that. Certainly he did. Um, and so, in reconciling those two philosophies together, I think that he, he started to ascribe uh, what each string actually really meant. And people were doing this for a while, too. So, for example, like the first string representing air, you have fire, and you have air, uh, water, earth, now, those are the elements, but they also related those to the four humors, which were, you know, let's say uh, an early empirical way of yeah. <laughs> trying to describe the temperaments of a person, their illnesses, etc. Uh, but music, medicine, art, philosophy, and science have just always been interlocked with each other. And I think that was something really unique that Zidiyad saw and was able to take with him everywhere, whether it was by choice or just by coincidence. Musically, Thank you for sharing that. that. That's really so helpful to understanding just his perspective and his soul for per, soulful perspective. What does the fifth string add musically that wasn't there prior to the fifth string? You know, it's difficult to say 100%, but uh, you know, he says the human soul, he felt like perhaps something was missing of these elements. And we can call this the ether, we can call it the soul, we can call it the spirit in essence. It's funny though, because it is in the middle, and usually you can ask any oud player, and more often than not, one of the first questions I'll get from an oud player is like, how's the middle string play? You know, how's the rate? You know, is it buzzing? Is it, 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 it is kind of like this central point to the instrument, uh, not only because it represents the middle range of the timbre of the instrument, but also because of the key that it's in, this particular one is in D, you know, and uh, there's just something about it that it allows you to go low and it allows you to go high, right? It, it, it serves as this kind of center for you. And it's usually one of the first things I check out when I'm playing an oud, or trying one out. It's like, how is that D? You know, is it clear? you really can go so many places. You know, it's kind of just right there. It's in the middle of the instrument. Before I get to the rest of his, thank you for that. Uh, uh, beautiful. 
Uh, before I get to the to the to the rest of his impact on uh, Western uh, uh, culture, talk to us a little bit about the uh, conservatory that he founded and, and what it offered what it offered for uh, European society. Conservatory is a, a big word. Sure. You know, uh, when we say this word, we imagine you know, this big extravagant building and professors and students walking in and out. I mean, the concept of university was still relatively new in, in, in this time, you know. But gatherings of people for learning purposes was not. I mean, we were talking about ancient Greece to the present. But I think Baghdad really uh, established and set in his mind what it meant to gather groups of scholars and groups of people in a, in a more orderly fashion uh, and to begin this process of education and matriculation to a place. Um, he took that with him to Cordoba and, and also all throughout. And I think somebody with his humble roots uh, understood that you know, this is a, a thing that needs to be shared with everybody. You know, up until that point, and, and even still to this day, even in Western society, music was not exactly accessible to every single person. You know, usually elite, usually the wealthy. Uh, something else that many don't really realize, too, is a lot of the music in Andalusia, especially early on, whether, you know, using the term slaves or, or enslaved, but um, many of the performers were women actually, and many of the singers were women. Many of the, if you look at images and pictures, many of the people who were playing percussion were women. Uh, this was kind of something very, very common, actually. Uh, Afropop Worldwide, the show, uh, actually has a three-part series that's really wonderful about this entire um, journey of Andalusia. And uh, many of the female singers were called Qiyan, and they were actually meant to really learn uh, mathematics, learn music, learn arts, learn poetry. So they were very learned people who were um, accepted and taken into different societies to serve in, in courts. And I think Zidiab really kind of helped to start uh, a very specific type of matriculation for them to, to learn this. But he opened it up to, to many people. And we have these accounts literally written down that you know he was teaching everybody, it didn't matter where they came from. You mentioned before that uh, uh, Zirya was a polymath, what we would call, right, a Renaissance person. Um, uh, it, it, it's amazing, it, is it not? Or maybe it shouldn't be, but that an Iraqi slave from Baghdad, former slave uh, from Baghdad, would bring a sense of style and elegance uh, to the uh, courts of Cordoba and Al-Andalus. Uh, and then, uh, which impacts all of Europe. So I want to take each one of them just in turn here and have you say a few words about how he impacted the cultural life. Uh, uh, Ziryab's influence on fashion, uh, I could say a lot myself, but please tell us about his impact on fashion. You know, a lot of what he learned really came from this new bustling aspect of Baghdad. Now, obviously his experiences and tra his travels also had a lot to do with that. But his etiquette and, and a lot of new things, if you will, not just fashion, that came out, he brought with him from Baghdad. So in, in the West, and when he gets to Cordoba especially, he is bringing you know, different uh, cloths, he's di bringing different colors of cloths, he's different, bringing different styles of, of cloaks and things like that, literally carrying them with him you know, on a camelback or on you know, caravan. Uh, and introducing this new kind of Western frontier to Islam and this, these new, this new culture that had not seen what was happening in the East. So lighter colors in the summer and spring and lighter fabrics uh, and darker colors in the, in the winter, um, uh, what we would call maybe earth tones in the fall. I mean, yeah. can you say a few? As, as deep as colors, uh, different fabrics, uh, it, hairstyles, he started you know, to cut his hair differently, everybody else started to, and lo and behold, sure enough, uh, a school of cosmetology is born. So that was, that was a, a little anecdote that, that really took me for a, a loop, but you know, if we put it into modern terms today, Beyonce, 
Jay-Z, Nicki Minaj, all of these pop icons, Michael Jackson, they didn't just give us music. They gave us a line of clothing. They gave us <laughs> perfumes. They gave us uh, everything from bobblehead dolls to <laughs> everything, you know. You brought up hair, uh, hairstyles and co cosmetology. Um, it, it, I mean, it's true, right, that uh, shorter hairstyles for men, bangs uh, for women, uh, toothpaste, mm. deodorant. I read somewhere uh, his shampoo uh, 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 was a mixture of rose water and salt. I mean, just in terms of personal hygiene and uh, how one looks matters. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it was a a big deal, and I think a lot of that etiquette was born in Baghdad for him. But because of his travels, uh, he spent quite some time in Tunisia. You know, that was a point in history that I wanted to really dig deeper into it. And Mokkari goes into it, but beyond him, I haven't seen very much else. Uh, but Kairouan was like what Baghdad was. This was a, another cultural jewel, uh, another new hub of Islam. And I think because the religion itself was still relatively new, there was this new, newfound kind of fervor that people had of, of being together, being linked by a language, being linked with Arabic, which traveled with Islam, along with other things as well. You know, that would be a very interesting, almost separate conversation, right? I mean, just uh, how, how the language weaves together these various cultures and practices and uh, 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 cultural norms. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about uh, uh, asparagus <laughs> and uh, uh, how uh, Ziryab impacted uh, the dining experience and even down to the, the tableware. You know, it's funny, the first <laughs> thing, I, I thought that when I arrived in Cordoba for the first time several years ago. Uh, I thought I would find so many things about Zidyev from his musical background. Uh, Paco de Lucia, who, the phenomenal flamenco guitarist, one of his last works was an homage to Zidyev. So this person is still a very vibrant figure in, uh, in Andalusia and in Spain. But it wasn't music that I saw his name everywhere. It was attached to culinary arts. There's an entire Zidyev culinary arts like kind of like school, workshop, really? there's a, a, still a dish that he had introduced called the Ziryabiya, which is like a, a sweet dish, kind of like with, um, with syrup and, and, and like a, a dough, similar to like a filo dough, or, or like a knafa dough almost, really. <laughs> uh, and it, it's just, uh, he introduced lots of things I think that he himself was influenced by. When it came to asparagus, uh, that was just a small footnote and anecdote I read, you know, and... No, uh, I read it too, though. Yeah, <laughs> you read it, you know, and he brought it there, and, and that recipe is still there. There are literally maybe four or five different cookbooks with Zidiev uh, as a main feature in those cookbooks. So, aside from that, too, he started to... He introduced um, the whole concept of serving meals and courses uh, that he saw in Baghdad, and many people might not know, but uh, when I say from soup to nuts, he coined that term. Yeah, when the English use it to encompass everything, right, the all, and from soup to nuts. I remember hearing it on, a, on an American commercial back in the 80s. <laughs> uh, from soup to nuts, we have everything at this hardware store. <laughs> from soup to nuts, from central, soup. Hard, from central hardware, scoop yes, to nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I trace this quote back to this guy. No, no way, no way. From soup to nuts. I'm like, what do you mean? And digging deeper into it, it's like, holy cow, even, even a little phrase like that has lived this test of time. So, yeah, I'm changing the way people drank, you know, from glassware, uh, serving the meals, the types of meals that were served, the order in which they were served. Um, it was all about, he was made a minister of culture, you know, ultimately. That's, that's what Abdul Rahman, you know, the mean made of him, and he saw that. You're the guy that we need here in this new burgeoning kind of uh, society that we have uh, to really put it out there. And he became a catalyst. He, uh, uh, you talk in your play about envy being what causes him to leave Baghdad. Uh, and yet he's accepted. Uh, here's this uh, ex-slave, dark-complected and all the rest, 
but he's accepted in this role in Cordoba. You know, it, the whole exile story too, you know, I've, I've read accounts that say it's there, some, I mean the truth is we're talking about history that's 1200 years ago. Sure. And uh, embellishment is, is bound to come out. That is the most common legend, though. No, kind sure. of the same way, you know, Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'm sure that the interpretations that people have given uh, make something like that to be more of a compelling story. Uh, is there some truth to it, perhaps? You know, um, it, it, it's not out of the realm of, you know, possibility. His teacher had, a, 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 you know, he was... Kind of like Mozart and Salieri, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> his teacher had this position in, in the court, and uh, you know his father was a well-known person, and you know here comes his student who's been teaching, who all of a sudden wins favor with this new style, and he's got these ideas, uh, and he says, "Hey, hey, hey, <laughs> slow your roll." And I think though part of it might have been a little bit of that, but part of it might have also been that you just can't lock in this spirit the spirit of somebody like, like this person, who was such an enigmatic figure, he probably was just looking for a reason to leave. But he's well. accepted in Cordoba. Well, he's accepted in Cordoba just like everybody was accepted in Cordoba. I mean, imagine the western frontier of, of the Americas. Like, anybody who can make it out there, hey, if you made it here, I know what that arduous trip was like. Uh, not only are you accepted, what can you give? And so, but he was accepted in Cordoba, mind you, several years after his travels, after leaving Baghdad as well. So he had quite a, a, a bit to offer. You've offered this through the Silk Road Rising uh, series. Tell us about Silk Road Rising. I mean, we know many of us about Silk, Silk Road and what that means, but tell us about the Silk Road, tell us about the series, and tell us about how this performance fits into that. Silk Road Rising is an exceptional theater company in Chicago. And it's run by my dear friends Jamil Khoury and his partner Malik Jalani. And they established, uh, they both worked a lot in international work. Uh, one worked with the UN for a little while. And, and they found art to be quite powerful of a medium to give agency and voice to the voiceless. Particularly when it came to them, you know, what their backgrounds were. Um, Syrian Orthodox Christian and uh, Indian Pakistani Muslim. And they started this theater company to really set forth that we want to hear Asian voices, we want to hear Middle Eastern voices, African voices, and many of the cultures that come along the Silk Road. And that's why they called then from Silk Road Theater to Silk Road Rising, meaning that, you know, the, the caravan sarais that were along the Silk Road extended all the way to Macedonia, sure, you know, and, and beyond. And the concept itself of trade and, and exchange has, has been something since time immemorial. And so they wanted to honor that, but they wanted to honor these stories that they weren't seeing uh, in, in theater so much. Uh, particularly, you know, theaters who every year it was Brigadoon, or <laughs> every year it was just this same kind of, kind of thing, and they weren't seeing themselves or their cultures represented. So they decided to start this small theater company, and from it branch out into a variety of different types of series. Some were just standard production plays, some, uh, they became very pro prolific in creating video plays, uh, so it was a play ostensibly that's kind of like a movie, but it's a play. And uh, videotaped and available to folks to watch. And they started to touch upon pressing issues, you know, Islamophobia, homophobia, um, the role of the East and the West, and uh, all of these sorts of things. And one year they started a solo series, uh, and they were asking people that, hey, do you have a story to tell? And we'd like for you to put a little bit of yourself in it. When I had originally written the story of Zidyeb at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, I just wrote about Zidyeb. I didn't put myself in it whatsoever. Uh, but they really inspired me to say, no, we want to hear your story through this. And that made me rethink not only the story of Zidyeb, but the entire arc of the story. And I thought, well, what is unique? What's that common thread between the era that Zidyeb lived in and where I live? And then my grandmother came into the picture too, I'm talking to her about her experiences in Jerusalem, pre-48, pre-Nekba. And I thought, well, this is a common thread. How do cosmopolitan societies, pluralistic societies, live with each other? Uh, what was that secret? And what better place to start than, you know, ninth century under the sea, which was a model for this kind of coexistence 
that lasted for a very long time. And if people don't realize, that this, this is the thing I wanted to get across to others, is that, okay, here's the common thread, and it leads all the way right here to me in America today, is, is that everything that happened during this era, at that turning point in 1492, we in Western society and society in general around the world need to realize this was a point of departure of human civilization. All of humanity shifted in that moment with not just colonialism, but our expansion of, of uh, being able to travel seas, being uh, technology and all of that stuff. It was built on what was happening in this era. You know, uh, I mentioned before that it wasn't surprising to me that you would focus on Ziryab and his, his uh, uh, experience in, the, in these two great uh, uh, centers of coexistence and uh, great diversity, the Beit al-Hikmah and then uh, uh, the great the diverse society, the Muslim society of Al-Andalus. And you make the point in the play that about the divergence in 1492, but if it could happen in those two places, it can happen again today, and that's really, I mean, it's, it's at the core of your spiritual life, your professional life, your, your soul, mm. that uh, uh, your music, that uh, this, is, this is really at the heart of what humanity is about. I, yeah, I mean, Zidiab is a, a, a role model, and in some ways was my framing device, to use this term, you know, and being able to tell the background of a story of what circumstances even allowed this person to be able to contribute to society in such a way. And uh, I couldn't but help think like, wow, this, it reminds me of being in America. It reminds me a lot of what my mother, grandmother described in Jerusalem. When, when people from different backgrounds get together, I think we accelerate not only knowledge and learning, but this biodiversity, if you will, to apply it to, you know, anthropology or to apply it to more of a human sense, it's, it's going to be required. I think it's, it's probably going to be one of the only salvations we have because in Arabic we say, uh, one hand doesn't clap alone, <laughs> you know? Um, I want to wrap up the interview by uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, ever since the first time we met, I, we met number of years ago, we'd been talking about you doing Ziryab here in Fort Wayne. That's true. That was the first thing we talked about, and then we got sidetracked, and you came with uh, the Sarabi Ensemble, mm -hmm. and then you came with the Dervishes mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Sufi music. You've been here for Arab Fest, a uh, number of other occasions. Tell us uh, about Ronnie's vision. I know that now you're in grad school. Tell us about what's next. What's the next project? What's the next dream? What's the next vision that you have musically? You know, it's a, it's a little bit of, you know, it's two things really. Sometimes you can plan, <laughs> and sometimes God plans, <laughs> you know. Uh, I've lived a lot of my life, in Arabic we say, which means in the, in, in the pathway of wherever God puts you, right? It doesn't mean I'm a religious person or anything, it's just that there's a if I put it in a musical term, you find your rhythm in life, and when you start to notice the serendipity or the coincidences of, around you, it's not that they're just coincidences, it means that you are walking in, in the rhythm that you should be walking in. And I try to follow that. Right now, I'm, you know, uh, studying another passion of mine, which is outside of music, but has always been tied to it, which is linguistics, language, and uh, a lot of it has been informed about the classical poetry that came out of Andalusia, the Muashahat. So my studies right now are basically classical Arabic and modern Hebrew. Uh, and part of the reason is I'm very convinced that being armed with this knowledge is going to be helpful for me to create some kind of a portal or a pathway to, to bridge a gap between people, particularly Palestinian and Israeli, which is, you know, a biased interest for me, at least. I mean, it's that's that's my heritage, it's my my background. But to create, not just it's not a dialogue, but to get a better understanding. And if there is something that I can do, whether it's put out, uh, publish a book, whether it's to write, whether it's to create a, an artistic project of sorts, 
that not only creates understanding between these peoples, but also everybody in the world to have a better understanding of what's really happening there. That is, that's probably my more immediate goal uh, right now is what we're doing. Ronnie, we love you here in Fort Wayne. <laughs> well, I love to be here. I love you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.